You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 42. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed last week's conversation with maestro Marin Alsop. And for you today, I have solo violinist Arnaud Sussman. Arnaud is the winner of a 2009 Avery Fisher Career Grant, and he's distinguished himself with his unique sound, bravura, and profound musicianship. Capturing the attention of classical critics and audiences around the globe, Arnaud has appeared as a soloist with several orchestras and performed recitals on world-class stages and at renowned festivals. A dedicated chamber musician, he's been a member of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center since 2006, and he has regularly appeared with them in New York and on tour. A frequent recording artist, he's released albums on Deutsch Gramophone, Naxos, Albany Records, and Siema Studio recording labels. His solo debut disc, featuring three Brahms violin sonatas with pianist Orion West, was released in December 2014 on the Talos Music label. He's been featured on multiple PBS Live from Lincoln Center broadcasts alongside Itzhak Perlman in the Perlman Music Program and with musicians of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. Born in Strasbourg, France, and based now in New York City, Arnaud Sussman trained at the Conservatoire de Paris and the Juilliard School with Boris Garlitsky and Isaac Perlman. Winner of several international competitions, he was named a Starling Fellow in 2006. Arnaud now teaches at Stony Brook University on Long Island and was recently named co-artistic director of Music at Menlo's International Music Program. In this episode, we discuss mindsets and strategies to adopt when working on sound quality, the importance of having a strong concept of phrasing and of bow distribution and musicality, the importance of creating fluency in his playing and how he achieves it, the importance of purpose in our practice, warming up during busy periods, the value of recording ourselves when we practice, and why he believes it's important to work hard. And for the French speakers, stick around at the end. Arnaud et moi continuons la discussion en français aux alentours de la minute 32. On vous offre un retour sur certains points abordés en anglais en ce qui a trait à la production du son et du phrasé, et une conversation sur l'importance de la curiosité dans la pratique et sur comment il aborde une œuvre nouvelle. It's an information and inspiration-packed episode, and I hope you enjoy and find value in our discussion. And if so, please share the love and tell a friend about the podcast. Let's go to the show. Arnaud Sussman, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You and I have never met, but we have many friends in common, including some guests on season one of the podcast, like Matthew Lipman. And I saw your name starting to pop up just about everywhere a few years ago, and I've been a follower ever since on social media and also catching your YouTube videos, uh, which are fantastic, by the way. I hope everyone goes to YouTube and catches your performance there. And I'm just so thrilled to be speaking with you today because I'm a huge fan of your wonderful playing. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be talking to you. There's another reason I'm happy, too, is because you're a French speaker like me. So after our English conversation, we're going to switch to French for a little bit and have some fun. So I hope our That's right. I hope our French listeners stick around for that. Mm -hmm. First, Arnaud, I'd love for my listeners to get to hear your story in your own words. So can you please tell us a little bit about your musical journey and how you got to where you are today? Okay. Uh, well, I was born in France, and I grew up there um, until 2001 when I moved to the U.S. Um, I grew up in the south of France. Sounds like you're in New York City right now, actually. Yeah, I'm in New York. Sorry, I can't do anything about this. <laughs> uh, it just adds to the, the whole atmosphere. Yes, I'm in my apartment. I just got back last night. Uh, but to, anyways, to go back to uh, my musical journey. Yeah, so I grew up in the south of France in Nice, where I did my studies at the conservatory. And uh, uh, about 14 years old, I went to study in Lyon for one year and then in Paris with a gentleman who is uh, still, I consider my mentor and, and somebody who influenced me tremendously. His name is Boris Garlitsky, he's a Russian violinist. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, I just played on FaceTime for him uh, three days ago before going on to play Brahms' third violin sonata. So I, I call him regularly and we have great uh, musical conversations. Uh, and so I studied with him for a few years. And uh, in 2001, I moved to the U.S. I had the opportunity to come study at Juilliard with Itzhak Perlman. Uh, and I studied with him for six years. I did my undergrad and uh, uh, my master's with him. And uh, after that, uh, or actually while I was still in school, I started um, playing for the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, which has been basically the, the, the biggest part of my life for, the, for more than 10 years now. And uh, so it was a very nice transition because as I was a student, I started to, to, to play concerts with the society at Lincoln Center. And, um, and after school, yeah, I just uh, was playing a lot of concerts, uh, both solo and chamber music. And uh, in recent years, about five years ago, I started teaching at Stony Brook University, which has been a great addition to my life. And uh, there are uh, new things coming up in my life, which maybe we can talk about later, including a new artistic directorship. But so my life has been kind of uh, gradually evolving my, my musical life uh, to where it is now, which is I uh, consider a very fulfilling and varied uh, place that I have. I, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do a lot of things that I like to do and that I want to do in this music world. And let's talk about it now. What is that new amazing project you just mentioned yes uh well i uh, just signed a contract to be the new artistic director uh for the chamber music society of palm beach in florida which is uh, very exciting to me it's kind of the uh, next step in in my journey now uh so i'll be running a, a series um, uh, that happens during the year uh, uh, that has been going on for a few years now and uh, i'll just be taking over starting uh, in a few weeks. Wow, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And you were just mentioning the Chamber Music Society Lincoln Center. Are, what is the 1920 season looking like for you? What are some fun projects that you're looking forward to? Uh, well, we, uh, uh, I, do, I go on a lot of tours with the Society. Uh, and so we have a couple fun tours uh, to look forward to. One, we're going back to uh, Colombia, the country of Colombia, uh, to Bogota and Medellin this time. Uh, we have a tour in Asia uh in uh, november uh, in december if i'm not mistaken we're going to taiwan and china uh i know i'm playing schubert cello quintet in new york um mm -hmm. i think in october maybe and you know i try i kind of go week by week here so i don't <laughs> totally remember everything that's coming on this season but there are always very exciting concerts uh with the society so i'm looking forward to it all and actually i see that you're playing the Schubert Quintet here in Chicago, October 23rd at the Harris Theater. So I really hope I can right. catch that because yes. I remember being, a, you know, like any 14 year old, this year dream piece that you want to play. So it's always been one of my favorite. Oh, same for me. Yeah, absolutely. I should say you have a fantastic website. So I hope everybody goes on the website and uh, check out your dates, read your bio, all of that nice stuff. Yes, absolutely. I actually just updated it. So it's all up to date. People can see all the uh, concerts I have uh, for the rest of the year. Arnaud, you have, as we just talked about, a very busy solo and chamber music career. And you have an amazing technique and you're an excellent violinist. But for me, it goes way beyond this in terms of artistry. And one of my favorite things about your playing, well, I should say two of my favorite things about your playing are your exceptional sound and your ability to shape wonderful phrases so i'd love to talk about this with you a little bit first if we can talk about maybe sound quality because that's something that i think we're all after regardless of our instrument and that's one of the biggest questions i get from students and from listeners is how to work on sound quality yeah so i'd love to hear about how you work on developing your sound and what are some techniques or some approaches that young musicians could use to develop their sound right uh it's a great question and i get this often and it's a somewhat difficult answer because there are many factors i think uh, involved in in working on your sound 
I think probably first and foremost, I would say that the sound is really something that's within you. I often joke, joke with my friends uh, because I, you know, they know that I'm a violin nerd in terms of the equipment, the violins, the bows, <laughs> the strings, all of this. But you can give me any violin and I sound like myself. And I think it's true of a lot of people. And so that really means that at the end of the day, your sound is your sound and, and an instrument can sort of push you one way or another, but your sound is within you. And so I think that comes originally from just developing your 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 ears and, and what you what it is that you love in in a sound. And so for me I, I just know that I as a child I listened to a million recordings of all the all the great violinists from the past that I love, Oystra, Heifetz, Milstein, uh, and all of them, you know, and and I think that helped me develop kind of an old school sound in my head which i you know try to reproduce then on the violin so so listening to a lot of these uh, musicians that you love i think is an important thing and and then in terms of technically um on the instrument um it, it comes from first and foremost your uh, approach to the to the instrument the posture the the relaxation that you should have when you when you play the violin which is such an awkward instrument and so i think a lot of people's sound may end up sounding a little tight because they're physically tight and so one of the biggest aspects of violin playing that i think of all the time is how to be as relaxed as I can, more relaxed. I always want to be more and more relaxed, more uh, to have more depth in the string without without uh, working hard at all. And uh, I think uh, the biggest concept that came from my uh, teacher Boris Garlitsky in France, uh, and it's a very Russian concept, is to use gravity. Use gravity to your advantage. Never fight gravity. And and to to use that force to your advantage so that you can create. Uh, sound and play violin with as, as little effort as possible. So that's that's kind of a simple answer as far as the sound. And then of course, if you go um, uh, in depth into other technical aspects, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about a ton in recent years is bow distribution, because that really affects um, how you're going to shape a phrase and how you're going to produce uh, what you want to do musically because at the end of the day if it's just a gorgeous sound without the music behind it I don't think it really uh, comes across as beautifully so you want to make sure always that your sound is there to serve to serve the music in order to do that you have to use all the tools that you have including bow distribution and pressure and weight and all of the things uh, in order to create the most beautiful music you can so that I I think I've covered kind of the different uh, aspects of this. Again, just making sure you develop your sound through listening to musicians that you love and, and their sounds. And then on the technical aspects, making sure that you're never working against your instrument, but with the instrument, with gravity, and just being as relaxed as possible. Yeah, these are such important concepts that you mentioned. And I don't know, I mean, you being from France, I'm guessing that maybe you went through a similar system that we have in Quebec, which is the conservatoire system, mm -hmm. where we have a pretty substantial background in ear training yes. from a very young age mm -hmm. of solfege and dictation and even uh, elements of uh, music theory and history. And I feel that for me, it made such a big difference in how I develop my sound because from a young age, you are really encouraged to listen And that's something I would encourage students. We we see them, you know, roll their eyes so often at the idea of going to ear training, but it is so closely related to how we play. Yes. So I'm so happy that you mentioned all of those things. Absolutely. And I totally agree with you in terms of the, the bow management, you know, the bow distribution and all of these elements. And it's really crazy to think how to express a phrase, you know, a concept that we have in our ear, we really have to put it through a, um, how could I say, a, um, a sound plan. We really need to plan those things so efficiently. How, how does it go for you between the concept of a phrase that you have in your head and how you execute it? 
Yeah, well, uh, as we just discussed, this this bow distribution business, I think it's one of the most underexplored concept with especially with young players but to be honest with even much more experienced players i think uh, i don't know if it's from people's trainings or or whatnot but you know often people put the bow down on the string and just pull full bows or or don't really think about you know the impact that your bow distribution has on on a on a phrase um but it's not just that it's also as of late i've been thinking a lot about uh, fingerings and bowings because really it's a it's a art and and it really is also what helps you create the most beautiful beautiful phrases i i used to think that you know up bow down bow doesn't matter e string a string doesn't matter you should be able to create the most beautiful phrase and in uh as an idea it's true you should be able to do you know left right up down doesn't matter but but at the end of the day i think that uh everybody should be spending so much time in the practice room uh, figuring out all these little details because that's really what creates your phrase and of course you want to be you want to leave a little bit of room for inspiration and freedom in your playing you know you don't want to practice to the point that you're just repeating exactly what you do in the practice room but you also need to figure out all the little details um, and and that starts with bowing fingerings and and your bow distribution mm -hmm. It's so true, very true. And I find that sometimes when we um, really develop what I could maybe call a precise choreography for a phrase, at first I remember my teacher was really big on bow distribution and sometimes I would sit down and write through a phrase exactly the distribution of my bow and where I would play. Mm -hmm. And then I would practice it a few times and then the body starts to assimilate and really kind of, um, associate different sounds and different colors, different dynamics to gestures. And then this bow distribution starts to happen automatically. So the idea comes to your head and you can start to execute it without having to plan it. I don't know if that makes Absolutely. sense. No, no, I, I agree with you. And that's one thing I was thinking about. Maybe the most important thing that I can share today is the, you know, because the idea of practicing is, is, um, uh, people can take it in so many different ways. And I, at the end of the day, I think that what I try to do when I practice, and I do practice a lot on a daily basis or when, when I can, it's not every day, but, but I think the most important thing that I try to do in my practicing is to develop a certain fluency in my playing. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. to, to repeat things over and over so that I can, I can try and do exactly that in the, in the, in the concert hall, but it's just to develop some sort of freedom and fluency so that uh, under any situation, it all feels as natural and as easy as possible. I don't know if that makes sense, but, uh, and that's why I, every day I force myself to do etudes and I try to have a, a full regimen of varied repertoire some Bach and some Isai if I can, and maybe just play through a movement of a concerto or something, just to keep a, a diet that uh, pushes me in different directions technically, but mostly it's just so that there is that, that fluency, just kind of um, trying to every day feel more and more comfortable on the violin. Now, I, it doesn't work every single day. There's some days that where the violin feels very foreign. I think everybody experiences that, but, but uh, I think the goal is just to try and and make that instrument that at at first is just such an awkward instrument to play the position of your arms is just so silly and uh, and so it's just to uh, develop <laughs> a way to play that that um, feels the most natural possible that's i think the most important thing for me about practicing is just to get the, get a flow in my playing uh from um, all the practicing that i do you mentioned earlier how important Mr. Garlitsky was for your development and, and what a precious mentor he was for you. Would you say that you got most of your, maybe I could call it the foundational practicing habits from him? Yes, 100%. Uh, I, I would say most of the biggest concepts when it comes to the approach of the violin comes uh, come directly from Mr. Garlitsky, both from watching him play. He, he is such a beautiful, effortless violinist uh and so elegant in in his approach to the instrument 
Um, and also just from, yeah, what uh, all he taught me, we, uh, a, a lot of the technique was built on don't etudes. So that's why I have a particular affinity for these etudes. And what one thing that I remember him doing was always correlating the work that we would do on an etude with uh, how it will apply in the real world. So, you know, pointing out the fact that uh, maybe don't etude number one, the chords is going to hopefully be helpful f when you play a Bach fugue and you have three or four note chords, etc. You know, and so it was not just to practice an etude, but in order, you know, in order to serve the music later on. Mm. I'm so glad you brought this up because it's so true how often I would say students feel like you know, maybe they don't always understand the importance of practicing etudes, but it's this correlation that you mentioned that really the etude is in the service of the repertoire that we are also eager to get to. But absolutely, you it 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 should always feel like it's serving you know for the real music that you're going to be playing later on. And again, for me, that's that's what I'm talking about about this fluency on the instrument is you know on a. Uh, Quite often, I will just open my Don Etude book or my Rode Etude book and kind of read through a bunch of etudes. You know, for an hour, I just read maybe eight or nine or ten, and and you know, you you should hopefully get to a point in your violin playing where none of this feels like work, and you know, the intonation is good and the sound is good, and your phrasing and and you're just playing violin but at the same time you're practicing but you're you're practicing for that fluency that i'm talking mm. about i hope that makes sense uh, people understand what i mean by that that makes total sense how do you feel like your practice has evolved throughout the years um well i can't say i've always practiced very well that's that's a fact um, and i think maybe a lot of people can relate to that but uh, i think as you get older of course you start uh, to be a little bit uh, more conscious about the time that you have and you can't waste as much time playing the instrument. There's also an element of, I just love, you know, playing the violin. So often it's just a lot of playing just because I enjoy that relationship with the instrument. But nowadays it's, you know, uh, I've got to make sure that uh, the practicing is, uh, uh, has a real purpose. And, uh, uh, also nowadays, I feel like a lot of a lot of the practicing. Of the, for example, this morning I was practicing Dachnani Serenade, uh, which I have to play in about ten days. And in a way, my, the practicing that I have to do nowadays is to undo some of the bad habits or the bad <laughs> fingerings or bad bowings that I practiced in the past. Or may, or you know maybe at the time they weren't all that bad, uh, but but now I'm I've, I'm rethinking. You know. Um, better fingerings, better boings, things that are going to make the music speak better. So a lot of the practicing nowadays is is to try and it's just fine details, you know, it's fine tuning, it's just trying to uh, bring uh, bring music to the next level. And that's something that's very important because um, I think people can get to a high level and sort of stay at that level and be content with it. And that's one thing that I learned from, from Mr. Garliski also is always searching, always, um, it, it can always be done differently, better, uh, and and you should never settle for, if you feel like you've practiced a piece well enough and you're playing it very well and there's, you know, you don't need to do anything else to the piece that should, you should never feel that mm -hmm. way and so nowadays the practicing is for either undoing some of the bad habits or or trying to improve the fine details mm. i love that you what you said about practicing with purpose it makes such a big difference absolutely it's really the secret sauce behind it all isn't it <laughs> yes i think so everything you do should be with purpose in life you know uh but but certainly you're practicing um, when you have limited hours in the day, uh, it it's really has to be done with a clear goal in mind. Arnaud, I'd love to keep talking all day, but I want to be mindful of your time. And before I take you through the rapid fire questions, I have a few listener questions. Yes. First, that's a very down to earth question. Mondo wants to know what kind of strings you use. Uh, I, I try different strings every so often. I've been playing the, uh, pies by, uh, the Peter Infeld strings, uh, for the last few years. And recently I, I've been trying the rondos also by Tomastic. Um, and, um, 
it, it, it varies. You know, so I, I often have a different set in my case, and so I'll try something else. But I usually play tomastic strings um, on, on my instrument. Bella was curious to know about a specific warm-up routine, and you already mentioned many elements earlier in our conversation. And another aspect of your career is how busy you are. You mentioned that, you know, we want to maintain good playing shape while juggling a very busy schedule. So what would be maybe a um, condensed warm-up routine for you during a really busy time? Yes. Okay. Well, there's only one uh, etude. If I have very limited time, don't etude number eight. It's the one in thirds, and uh, that will warm you up very fast. You have to be careful, you know, <laughs> not to hurt yourself because it, it can at times uh, – you know, get your hand a little tired, but that is the perfect etude if you have limited time to to warm up. But I should point out that uh, uh, my friend and mentor, Pamela Frank, often talks about uh, warming up, and she, she often says that if you have limited time, you can also just run around the block because really what warming up is is just getting your blood flowing and your heart rate up a little bit. And so, uh, so sometimes when I have to play a concerto backstage and I'm getting cold because, I, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to get on stage, I do jumping jacks, I kind of run back and forth, whatever it is, I can get my heart rate up. That's an, another way to warm up. But but if I mm. just have a few minutes, don't etude number eight. That that would be my go-to etude. And you could play don't eight while running around the block for you know, just maximum effect. That, exactly. That would be the perfect warm-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick wanted to know how you approach learning the score as a whole. And what he meant by that, I think, is that going beyond your solo line and getting a grasp of the harmony and the chord structure? Yes, that's a great, great question. That's another thing that as a, as a younger musician, I wouldn't necessarily do. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people can relate to that, but it, 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 it just makes no sense. It's like if you learn a play, but you only learn your lines, so you don't know what the rest of the, the story is about. And it's the same thing for for um, any piece of music that has more than just the violin. So um, I find, you know, you, 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 you've got to buy the score or download it on IMSLP. I've got, you know, I've got an iPad with me when I travel. And so I'm always practicing off of the score. And I, uh, you can ask all my students at Stony Brook, we always have the score in front of us, you know, uh, uh, in order to know what the, what the rest of the orchestra or the piano, the pianist is doing. Uh, so that's, that's a very important thing. Uh, because at the end of the day, of course, we're talking about, you know, the technique in your practicing and all this stuff, but it's also incredibly important to uh, delve into the music. Everything that we do on the technical side is to serve the music. That is something that people really have to remember is to serve the music. So if you play technically perfectly, but you don't know what you're doing musically, uh, then there is no reason to play music really. Mm, such a great answer. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Ready for rapid fire questions? Okay. So what's your favorite tool in the practice room? Maybe it's my phone with the, 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 the tuner on it. So I can, hmm. you know, check the either intonation if I can put a drone on uh, with that, that application or it also does metronome and, and then just, you know, gives me the 440, 441A so I can tune my violin properly. Mm. And, you know, I always uh, ruin the rapid aspect of the, the round of questions by asking additional questions, but I was wondering about... Uh, recording yourself when you practice. We were talking about phrasing and sound earlier, and you post yes. these fantastic capsules on Instagram uh, where you show how you practice and you work through passages and things like this. What do you think about recording ourselves when we practice? Oh, it's it's incredibly important, and it's partly the reason why I started doing the whole social media thing a few years ago. It was in order to push myself because you know I, I to be honest I, I hate recording myself I, I hate having to listen to myself it's just the hardest thing I think a lot of people can relate to that it's like hearing your own voice you know when you when you hear a recording of your own voice and but it's it's incredibly important because there's nothing like hearing how you sound from the outside you know it, there's one thing about you know feeling what we're feeling when we play but when, whenever you listen from the outside there are always things that you hear that you may not have heard uh, with you know within your own playing so so it's very important and people should not be lazy about this. Force yourself. You can just record, you know, short phrases. Nowadays, we, we have our phones, which are 
totally fine for audio quality and video quality. Of course, you can practice in front of a mirror uh, in terms of looking at your posture and you know your bow and all this stuff. But but recording yourself and hearing back is also very important. Mm. What skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? Well, um, I don't know if it's a skill, but but it's not good enough to just be a great player. You have to be a great person also, especially mm -hmm. if you play a lot of chamber music, but even as a soloist or whatever you end up doing in the music world, you, you have to make sure that you're a great colleague. Uh, I always say this, it's not enough to just be a great player. And, uh, but on top of that, I think, um, you know, we have so many amazing tools nowadays with the, with the, the everything that happens on social media, uh, in order to share your music with the world. So if that's something you feel like doing, that's a nice thing to do in your life. And, uh, in order to, you know, publicize yourself. That's one of my favorite things about, about this social media experiment is, is the fact that it creates a community and I've met so many people around the world really that have uh, discovered me just through the online thing. So that would, that's an important thing now it is for young musicians, but, um, but really before that they should just be practicing and, uh, and developing their, their art. Mm -hmm. What's a habit that you have that you think has contributed to your success? Oh, well, I'm a tireless worker. I, I, there's not a day when I do, don't want to practice. Mm -hmm. I, it's just, uh, something that I love to do. And, uh, you know, people often ask, so how did you get to where you are? And, uh, well, I had of course, great support from my parents, which is very important. And there's always a little bit of luck involved with, uh, where people end up. But, uh, I, um, I also, I've just, I feel like I've put in the work and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's very important. There, there are no shortcuts, you know, mm -hmm. you have to put in the work, um, in order to get the results. Thanks so much for that answer. I think it's really important to hear. Yep. How about a quick actionable tip listeners can implement today in their musical lives? Open a book of etudes or download, like for, if you're a violinist, you go and download the Rode etudes and kind of just try to read through them. I make some of my students do this at Stony Brook because that's that fluency I'm talking about. It's not for detailed practicing. It's so that you can, ideally, if you want to consider yourself a great violinist or musician, you should be able, able to open most pieces of music and, and kind of play them, you know? I mean, not, maybe not necessarily perfectly, but it should all kind of flow naturally. And so that's, that's what I recommend doing. And in order to do that, you, you have to practice that. You have to practice being able to open, um, uh, you know, any piece of music and, 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 and read through it. And so the best way to do this, I think, is just through uh, etudes. That's the best thing. So that's what I would recommend. Go open a book of etudes and kind of read a couple of them and see how fluent you can be with them. Hmm. I absolutely love this one. Thank you so much. Okay. Arnaud, I want to thank you. We're going to switch to French now, but for the English listeners who are leaving us, I want to, you know, just say I appreciate so much taking the, you taking the time to talk with me today. It's so great. It's my pleasure. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Arnaud Sussman. I personally loved his approach to fluency and how he cultivates artistry through a thorough regimen, uh, finding this fluency that he talks about and ease in his playing by maintaining a strong technique. I also love that he admits to working really hard because there's no choice in music or anything else for that matter. If you want to reach higher levels of playing, you have to put in serious and dedicated work. As always, you can find the show notes for this episode and more information about Arnaud Sussman, as well as resources on mindful and deliberate practice at mindoverfinger.com. I would love to connect with you and know what your favorite takeaway from today's show is. So join the conversation on social media. You can find me everywhere as Mind Over Finger. If you're looking for a community of mindful practice enthusiasts, join the Mind Over Finger tribe at facebook.com slash groups slash Mind Over Finger tribe. There you'll find inspiration, motivation and support, as well as information and discussions on how to take your practice to the next level and enjoy the process. 
Next week, I'll be talking to Frank Rosenwein, principal oboe of the Cleveland Orchestra, about life as a principal wind player in a top orchestra. Again, thank you, and à bientôt! Arnaud Sassman, on vient de finir une super conversation en anglais et j'espère que nos amis francophones qui parlent anglais ont apprécié autant que moi. Mm -hmm. Comme je disais plus tôt, j'ai découvert il y a plusieurs années euh, via YouTube et les réseaux sociaux et j'adore ton jeu. Alors, c'est vraiment un très grand plaisir pour moi d'avoir la chance de discuter avec toi aujourd'hui. Merci, c'est un plaisir pour moi de te parler. Arnaud, j'ai beaucoup aimé euh, ce que tu as mentionné par rapport euh, à la qualité du son et à comment aborder, euh, travailler sur notre, euh, notre son et notre phrasé dans notre discussion mm -hmm. en anglais un petit peu plus tôt. Pourrais-tu, s'il te plaît, nous faire revisiter un peu les concepts de, mm -hmm. que tu nous as exposés un petit peu plus tôt pour l'auditoire francophone? Parce que je pense que ce sont des éléments vraiment importants. Mm -hmm. Bien, comme je disais, donc, il y a plusieurs éléments en ce qui concerne le son. Euh, L'une des premières choses euh, qui est importante, c'est de développer son son. Le, ton son, c'est ce qui est en toi. Euh, ce que, ce que j'ai dit en anglais plutôt, c'est qu'avec mes amis, on rigole parce que euh, tu peux me donner n'importe quel violon, n'importe quel archer, et au bout du compte, je sonne comme je sonne moi-même. C'est parce que le, le, le son vient euh, au fond de toi. Et, et je crois qu'au départ, c'est quelque chose que j'ai développé quand j'étais jeune, parce que j'écoutais des, des centaines d'enregistrements de, de, de violonistes et de musiciens que, de, du, du passé, euh, la plupart, euh, Oistrak, euh, Perlman, euh, Milstein, Heifetz, tous ces, tous ces grands violonistes qui, 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 ont, qui ont chacun un son vraiment particulier et, et, et qui, qui me touchait euh, euh, chacun avec leur son différent. Et donc, je crois que c'est au départ, c'est quelque chose qui m'a beaucoup influencé quand j'étais jeune. Et, et ensuite, ce que je disais, c'est aussi c'est euh, la tenue du violon. Com comment comment tu joues ton violon euh, Il faut être aussi euh, libre que possible quand tu fais du violon. C'est ça qui va pouvoir te permettre de rentrer dans la corde et d'avoir un son aussi profond que possible. Et donc ça, ça c'est un concept très important. C'est d'avoir une position aussi libre que possible parce qu'au départ, le violon, c'est un instrument tellement bizarre. Tu, tu as tes deux bras qui, qui sont mis dans des positions vraiment euh, impossibles et, euh, et, et il faut tout faire pour essayer d'être le plus libre possible. C'est quelque chose que j'ai appris de, de mon professeur quand j'étais à Lyon et Paris, Boris Garlitsky, c'est de, de, de se servir de, de, de toutes les forces qu'on a euh, à notre avantage et en particulier la gravité c'est un concept extrêmement important, c'est de vraiment de ne de, de, de pas se battre contre la gravité mais de, 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 de travailler avec la gravité et de, de, de s'en servir pour pouvoir produire le son aussi profond que possible. Et, euh, et d'autre part je disais aussi que de, le, la distribution de, de l'archer est quelque chose d'extrêmement important parce que c'est aussi ça qui te permet de, 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 de construire tes, tes phrases musicales et ça ne suffit pas non plus d'avoir juste un son magnifique mais qui, qui, qui ne change pas il faut, il faut pouvoir adapter le, le son, il faut pouvoir le changer il faut aussi pouvoir construire ta phrase et en partie c'est grâce à ce que tu fais avec ton archer mmh, c'est tout à fait vrai et il y a quelque chose que tu disais plus, euh, plus tôt dans la conversation en anglais qui me faisait vraiment penser au fait que je crois qu'une des choses que les élèves devraient passer plus de temps à faire, c'est vraiment une exploration. Toutes ces choses dont tu parles, le poids du bras, la relaxation, c'est des choses qu'il faut vraiment prendre le temps d'explorer et de, de devenir confortable avec ces concepts-là dans la, dans la salle de pratique. Et je pense que ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on fait assez. Ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on fait assez, puis ça, ça dépend aussi de, 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 de ton, ton ou tes professeurs, de, de, de quelle méthode ils vont employer pour t'apprendre le violon. Je, je, je dois dire que j'ai beaucoup de chance, parce que surtout grâce à ce monsieur Garlisky à Paris qui qui, euh, venant de la grande école russe de violon, m'a appris beaucoup de concepts qui, qui, qui m'ont vraiment aidé. Mais et c'est vraiment des petits détails. Le, la position du coude, le, de, de, du poignet de la main, de, du bras droit, de, de, de tes doigts. Enfin, tout est vraiment, c'est des détails minuscules. Et, et, et donc, il faut vraiment un professeur qui, qui t'apprenne les bonnes choses. Bien sûr, il y a des techniques différentes. Et je, je trouve que j'ai aussi la chance de, 
d'être venu ici aux États-Unis et de voir une autre perspective parce qu'il y a, il y a une production de son un petit peu différente, par exemple avec ce que j'ai appris avec Monsieur Perlman. Euh, mais donc c'est 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 vrai qu'il faut avoir un petit peu de chance de tomber sur un professeur qui va t'apprendre euh, euh, les bonnes techniques et euh, et puis ensuite aussi d'explorer par toi-même de de voir ce qui marche parce que une chose qui est très importante, j'essaie de me rappeler toujours quand je quand j'enseigne moi-même, c'est que on est construit tous de façon différente. Il n'y a personne qui a le, le même corps que toi. Bon, il y a des gens qui, qui ressemblent un petit peu à la même morphologie, mais pour la plupart, tout le monde est un petit peu différent et donc il faut adapter toutes les techniques que tu apprends en fonction de, de, de ton corps. Par exemple, moi j'ai un cou assez long, euh, j'ai des bras très longs et donc euh, je dis souvent à mes étudiants, n'essaie pas trop de regarder comment je fais les choses moi parce que ce ne sera pas la même chose pour toi. Si on a les bras de, de longueur différente, ton coude va, va avoir l'air d'être un petit peu plus haut, plus bas, euh, peu importe. Mais donc il faut toujours penser qu'on est chacun un petit peu différent. Il ne faut jamais essayer de copier les autres. Euh, souvent les gens me demandent qu'est-ce que tu mets comme coussin, qu'est-ce que tu fais avec la mentonnière, tout ça. Il ne faut jamais regarder ce que les autres font, il faut juste essayer de trouver ce qui marche pour toi. Mmh. Ça, c'est tellement vrai. Arnaud, tu as mentionné M. Garlitsky dans notre conversation en anglais et mmh. on a la, la nette impression que c'est une grande influence dans ta vie. Quels sont les concepts euh, les plus importants que tu penses que tu as retenus de lui ben, comme je disais, c'était en partie la, la, la gravité d'avoir de, 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 une élégance et, et, et une liberté dans le, le, quand tu joues du violon, en particulier avec l'archer, parce que je crois qu'il y a beaucoup de violonistes de haut niveau qui te diront que l'archer, c'est vraiment l'une des choses les plus importantes. La main gauche, bien sûr, c'est très important, mais, mais l'archer, c'est un petit peu ce qui peut, vraiment te permet de, de tout construire euh, au niveau musical. Et donc, euh, on, on bossait énormément là-dessus. Mais aussi, quelque chose, je dois dire, de très important, à part la technique avec M. Galeski, c'est ça que je respecte euh, euh, le plus euh, en ce qui concerne euh, ce monsieur, c'est que c'est un musicien qui est curieux qui s'arrête jamais de, de, de vouloir euh, apprendre plus. Il, 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 sent, il ne se sent jamais euh, euh, avoir fini d'apprendre un morceau. Et comme, par exemple, l'autre jour, comme je, comme je te dis en anglais, euh, je l'ai appelé sur FaceTime parce que je jouais la troisième sonate de Brahms et on en a discuté pendant une heure, ses concepts, mes concepts, qu'est-ce qu'il en pense, qu'est-ce que j'en pense. Et, et, et je vois que c'est quelqu'un qui, qui sent que, que ce sera jamais le, la fin de l'exploration musicale. Et ça, c'est très important parce qu'on peut parler autant de techniques qu'on veut mais au bout du compte, comme je disais aussi en anglais, la technique, ça ne fait que euh, pour, pour servir la musique. Mmh, extrêmement important, cette curiosité que tu mentionnes. Mmh. Arnaud, en terminant, je pense qu'une des questions qui revient le plus souvent est comment apprendre une pièce. Je pense que pour plusieurs jeunes musiciens, des fois, c'est un peu effrayant de se lancer dans l'approche d'une nouvelle œuvre. Euh, on ne sait pas toujours par où commencer. Mmh. Et... Évidemment, c'est certain que ça va être différent d'une œuvre à l'autre, mais j'aimerais beaucoup savoir si tu as peut-être une, une façon générale d'aborder une nouvelle pièce ou un processus que tu pourrais recommander mmh. qui euh, t'amène, toi, euh, dès tout début jusqu'au concert et peut-être quelque chose que les jeunes musiciens euh, qui nous écoutent pourraient peut-être essayer la prochaine fois qu'ils ont à apprendre un morceau. Mmh, mmh. euh, L'une des choses les plus importantes, bien évidemment, c'est d'avoir le score de ce que tu vas jouer, la, la partition d'orchestre si c'est un, si un concerto, ou la partition de piano si c'est une sonate, ou, ou le score de musique de chambre. Ça, il faut commencer toujours avec ça. Euh, il euh, y a plusieurs façons de faire les choses. Si, si, si tu as envie d'écouter un enregistrement avec le, le, le score, c'est possible. Euh, je ne recommande pas toujours parce que ça, aussi, ça peut t'influencer au début. Quand tu apprends un morceau, tu entends un enregistrement et tu essaies de copier tout de suite. Donc, ce n'est pas nécessaire d'écouter un enregistrement. Mais si tu, si tu promets que tu ne vas pas copier ce que tu entends dans l'enregistrement, c'est possible de faire ça pour que tu aies une idée de comment le, le morceau il, il sonne. Et, et ensuite, il faut, faut prendre les choses lentement. Il ne faut pas essayer de, de, de jouer tout vide euh, dès le départ il faut commencer très lentement et puis c est, c est une, c il faut explorer euh, euh, tu, 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 tu commences il faut, il faut explorer les doigtés et les coups d'archer immédiatement c est, c est, je l'ai dit en anglais mais j'aimerais bien le dire en français aussi une des choses les plus importantes ce qui vraiment te permet de, 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 de jouer un morceau vraiment de la façon dont tu as envie de jouer le morceau, c'est en, en essayant de découvrir tes doigtés et tes coups d'archer qui vont te permettre vraiment de faire la musique que toi, tu as envie de faire. Euh, très souvent, il y a des professeurs qui donnent leurs doigtés, donnent leurs coups d'archer, et c'est peut-être c'est bien de commencer par ça, parce que ça, ça peut peut-être un petit peu t'aider, mais au bout du compte, ça, c'est quelque chose qui est, qui est 
très important et, et honnêtement je, je le fais de plus en plus euh, euh, que j'avance dans le monde de la musique c'est de, de c'est ce que je passe le plus de temps à faire dans, quand je travaille c'est de, de chercher un meilleur doigté un meilleur coup d'archer qui va me permettre de, de jouer la musique euh, de la meilleure façon donc euh, c'est ça que je recommande c'est vraiment de prendre les choses lentement et puis d'essayer tu essaies euh, pousser tu essaies tirer tu essaies sur la corde là tu essaies sur la corde mi tout pour te servir euh, pour, pour servir la musique mmh. Arnaud Sassman un merci énorme pour cette mine d'informations et d'inspiration. Merci à toi. 